An alpha channel basically sits in the channels panel, hides out with the red and the green and the blue channels. And for the most part, we in Photoshop use it to store selection information. So if I were to make a selection, I could save that as an alpha channel. And let's say I made a new window, make a new document here. And sounds good, we'll create that. In the channels panel, we've got the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel. If I made a new channel, you'll notice first off, it calls it alpha one, because it's an alpha channel. And if I were to paint on this, if I took a paintbrush and I painted some white on it, da, 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 da. we don't see it when we're looking at our normal RGB view, but if I went under select, load selection, I could call up that alpha one, and I'd have a selection that was based on that alpha channel. But there are other things that we can do with alpha channels. If you get into doing any 3D rendering, 3D animation, uh, if you have to make an object that's going to get dropped into a video scene, well, if you make the object with a white background like we have in Photoshop, you could drop it into the scene, but it would have a white background around it. In 3D, an alpha channel is often used as transparency. So if you render something, it would come out as an image with an object and an alpha channel with black representing the parts that are supposed to be hidden. So once that got composited together, the alpha channel would show transparency, you wouldn't have that white background behind it. There's another thing we can do with alpha channels in Photoshop, and that is use it to define height. Um, one of the cool filters in Photoshop is the rendering effects, where you can render out lighting effects. And if you were to skim a light across the surface, let's say you had a piece of paper and you just ran a light kind of desk lamp sideways onto the sheet of paper here, it would look like a sheet of paper. But if that paper was raised slightly, let's say you know, it had a little bit of an embossing, you know, you got those birthday cards where you can feel the embossing on it. If the light shone across this way, it would you know, kind of make it sort of grayish. If you did it brighter, it might hit white. But if it had a raised texture to it, on the side of the texture tilted towards the light, it would come out lighter. And on the part tilted away from the light, it would come out darker. And that's what an alpha channel can do when you use the lighting effects filter. So let's give that a try. Just follow along on the screen here. And we're going to create chrome letters and objects. So we're going to start with a new document, 10 by 10, 300 pixels per inch. Probably seems a bit familiar. So from within Photoshop, let's just go File, New, 10 inches by 10 inches. So make sure that the units here is in inches. And we'll go 10 by 10 at 300 pixels per inch, which means we're going to have a document that's 3,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels. It says add some type and rasterize it. Let's talk about what the heck that even means. Has anybody made type in Photoshop before? You hit T on the keyboard, you get the text tool, looks like a big capital T. And if you click somewhere, you can make some type. All right. And then it says rasterize it. What the heck does that mean? We, we've talked a little bit about the different types of information in Photoshop. And for the most part, Photoshop is meant to deal with pixels, little colored squares. Um, but if you're used to Illustrator, uh, the pen tool, uh, there's another type of information, vector information. Um, and when you're working with type, type is actually vector. Like if I made some type, it says uh, add some type and rasterize it. So I'm going to put my name. Uh, so it says add some type. So if you hit T on the keyboard or you just go to that little icon in your tool panel, looks like a capital T. If you click, you can add some type. I'm going to put my name. There we go. I'll make it a little bit larger. When you've made type, if you select it, if you click and drag across it, just like you were trying to highlight something in Word, you can play around with the size of the type. Here I've got 19 point type. I'm going to make it 36 point. There we go. And you can play around with the fonts as well. You'll notice on the top left there, there's a little pop up where you got a bunch of different fonts. As you hover over the font, you should be able to see what that font looks like. I'm going to do something fairly bold. I'm going to do. I'm going to do impact. There we go. And when the type looks good, you can hit the check mark at the top in that little options bar there. So I've thrown some type onto there. Now, if your type comes up the wrong color, usually it'll come up whatever color your foreground is. So in my case, I had black as my foreground color. But if you'd had a different color selected, uh, this little rectangle here in the top of the options bar, notice this top bar changes depending on what tool you have selected. And when you have the type tool selected, this represents the color of the type. So if I were to select this type here and click on this pop-up, I get a color picker. I can make the type any color I want. I can make it red. I mean, ultimately, I want it to be black. But if you've got the wrong color, just highlight it. Click on that little rectangle there. And if you drag this little circle to anywhere along the bottom of that square, 
you'll always get black. Anywhere along the bottom will be black, and we'll hit OK. And then you can just click that check mark to accept it. Now, you can also play around with the size of type using the regular scale tools. Just like in Photoshop, if you're trying to scale something that you'd added in, we could go under Edit, Transform. I could choose Scale, and I could scale it that way as well. There's a bunch of different ways you can play around with the size of the type. So I'm going to make it eh, around that size. Actually, I'm going to put in a title as well. The guy who did the notes put Photography. I'm going to put Private... Aye, there we go. And if you want to play around with the spacing of the type, uh, again, in the top of the options bar here, uh, you'll see there's a few little icons. Like this one here shows the justification of the type. So there's center, there's left justified. Uh, actually, I should probably select all of it. There's center justified, and that's actually how I want mine. Center, there we go. All right. Um, you can play around with the spacing of the type. See this little thing looks like a, looks like a folder up here? There's a, an icon of a panel, and if you click on it, hey, look, the character panel pops up. And you can play around with the spacing in between letters. You can play around with the size of it. And when everything looks good, you can just hit the check mark there. There we go. Private eye. OK, so I've got some type here. And vector versus raster, what is the difference? Vector is basically uh, a description of the outlines that make up the object. So uh, when you use the pen tool, you're creating vector information. Type is the same sort of deal. Let me just quickly uh, show you what I mean. I'm just going to make a new document here to show you what this type thing here is all about. So let's say I put up some text. And I'll do something a bit fancier so you can see the curves. Let's do, uh, let's do Times New Roman. If I zoom in, I do still see pixels. And that's because Photoshop is a raster program. It's meant to deal with pixels. So the canvas, that 10 by 10 at 300 pixels per inch canvas that I created, has pixels to it. And it has rendered out a version of this that shows what it would look like on a pixel document with these pixels. But look at this capital T here. It is still vector. It's still text. It's still, it's still got all its editability. So if I realized I'd spelled something wrong, I could correct it. I could go from text to test. There we go. Now, it says in the handout that you should add some type. We've done that. And rasterize it. Let's talk about what rasterization does. Uh, I'm going to make a duplicate of this layer here. And I'm going to grab that duplicate, and I'm going to put it on the top there. And this duplicate, I'm going to right click on the name, and I'm going to choose Rasterize Type. <gasps> Did you see that happen? Look at this. If you zoom in there, oh, actually, they both still look exactly the same. But look at the icons. The capital T icon is still here on this one, telling us that it's still text. I could still change it. Uh, I could change the font. I could, I could have a lot of fun with it and you know, try a bunch of different fonts. The one up above, though, I. I can't do anything with it because it's just a bunch of pixels in the shape of text. Now, here's where the advantage of the vector format comes in and the fact that the text on the bottom is still vector. If I didn't know what size I wanted these to be, maybe I wanted them to be really small in the corner. So I selected both of them here. And I'll do an Edit, Transform, Scale. And I'll shrink them down. There we go. Now they're really, really, really tiny. And if I zoom in, remember the bottom one still had all of its vector information. So it was able to look at the vector file and say, OK, well, how would this look if it was this small? Well, it would look like this. This one only had the pixels. So when it scaled it down, it was able to look at the pixel information and say, OK, well, let's go from this many pixels down to this many. We have to throw away a whole lot of information. And well, I guess this is kind of what it would look like. So it didn't hold up quite so well along the top here. This didn't hold up so well. But it's not that bad. Scaling down isn't that big of an issue. The problems come when you try to take something small and make it really large. So if after having scaled it down, I said, actually, you know what? No, I want to use it as like a, a background image so that it takes up the whole background of this thing. Let me give that a try. So I'll just scale this up. There we go. And when I hit the check mark, the bottom one has all the original vector information to work with. And it's able to redraw that fairly accurate. The top one only had the vector information. All it had was these few pixels up here. So the best it could do was this. Whoops. OK, that went a bit large. But it certainly gives you an idea of what's going on here. So when you're dealing with anything vector, the longer you can keep it vector, the better things are going to be. Now, it says to rasterize the type, which kind of sucks. But you'll see why in a minute.
So let's get back to that document that we made. To rasterize type, you can simply right click on the title of the layer. Like this is the icon that represents the layer itself. This is the name of the layer. If I right click in here, I get a pop up and I can scroll down to rasterize type. And we have to rasterize it because we're going to be dealing with an alpha channel which only works with pixel information. So we can't use any of that vector information anymore. Plus, we want to put something else onto this layer that is also raster, that's also pixel based, and we can't do that while it was a type layer. So we right clicked on the name there and we chose rasterize type, and that turned it into a bunch of pixels. I'm also going to put a little border around the outside. Like if you look on the PDF there, it shows a little black border around the outside. Let's take a look at how he did that. I'm going to pop back into Photoshop here. And we've taken a look at various uh, selection tools. And if you go to the marquee tool or just hit M on the keyboard, we can do a click and a drag. And I'm going to put a little border around the outside of this thing. And we're going to do that using the stroke command. So grab the marquee tool or just hit M on the keyboard. Do a click and a drag so it puts a little border around the outside there. And then we're going to go under Edit, Stroke, and I'm going to guess at 30 pixels. And the color, we'll leave it at black. If you need to change the color, just click on that little rectangle there, grab the circle, drag it all the way to the bottom, and hit OK. And for the location, this is going to put a band of, in this case, black pixels, 30 pixels wide, and right now it's going to go on the inside of this little band here. Uh, if I chose center, it would go across the center, and if I chose outside, it would go on the outside. And you might think that wouldn't make a whole lot of difference, but it actually would. Let me just quickly show you the difference between inside, center, and outside. Notice how my marquee selection here has nice 90 degree hard corners. If I do a stroke on the inside, so tell it to go inside, hit OK, it puts a 30 pixel stroke on the inside. And whenever you're done with a selection, see how I've got the marching ants around here? I'm going to go under Select and choose Deselect. And look at how nice and sharp those corners are. Let me show you the other options in there. I'm going to undo that. And if I go under Edit, Stroke, and I put it on the center, it'll run, boink, right down the center. And oh, look at that. The inside, nice 90 degrees, but the outside, well, it's going 30 pixels out. The corner here is more than 30 pixels, so you get this kind of beveled corner. And if I do it on the outside, edit, stroke, outside, you get an even bigger bevel on the corner out there. Uh, so I tend to prefer doing it on the inside, but it's up to you guys. So I'm actually going to undo that. I'm going to do my edit stroke. And I'm also finding that that 30 pixels is maybe a little bit thin, so I'm actually going to do 50 pixels. This is life on the edge. Edit, stroke, I'm going to hit 50 pixels on the inside, and I'll hit OK. And if you're doing this for a client, that's something you would think about. Like, how big would you do that marquee? Well, if it's going on the inside, you want it to be a little bit larger. If you want it on the outside, just do it where you want the inside of that thing to be. Now, we're going to take this thing, and we're going to save it as an alpha channel. And you should have just one layer where we put all of this stuff. So if you look in the Layers panel there, we should have our background layer, which is full of white. And then we should have the layer where you got your type and that little band around there, which should have a transparent background. We're going to load this layer as a selection. Just like we can load an alpha channel as a selection, we can load a layer as a selection if we hold down the Command key and click on that layer. Watch what happens. If we hold the Command key and click right on the layer, we should have a selection based on the pixels on that layer. Now, we're going to take that selection and save it as an alpha channel. So we want to do something to a selection. We've got a selection that represents our type and our little border here. We're going to go into the Select menu, because we want to do something to a selection. And then we're going to save that as an alpha channel. So we go under Select and Save Selection, dot, dot, dot. Anybody know what the three dots after the name means? Save Selection, dot, dot, dot just means something else is going to pop up. If there's no dots after it, like select subject, select or transform selection, um, nothing else pops up. It just does it. But with save selection, dot, 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 it says, what do you want to call it? Well, we can call it anything we want. Whatever you put in there. It doesn't matter. It's just an alpha channel. And we hit OK. And just for fun, if you look in the channels panel, 
There it is, the alpha channel. Now it came in the exact other way around. An alpha channel, the white, when you're loading it as a selection, represents selected. So because we had this part here selected, it filled it with white, everything else became black. So in a way, it's kind of the exact opposite of what we had here. White background, black type. Now we have white type, black background. And we have these little marching ants going. What do you do with the marching ants when we're done with them? We deselect them. Command D, or if you're on Windows, Control D. Or you can go into the Select menu and choose Deselect. All right, so that's our alpha channel. And it's just hanging out there doing its little alpha channel thing, which at the moment is absolutely nothing. Um, so let's pop back to our RGB here. Let's see what the notes have to say. We have something like this. We command clicked or control clicked if you're on Windows, the thumbnail to load it as a selection. Then we went to the select menu, saved it, created an alpha channel, and we did a control D or a command D to deselect. All right, channels panel, and click on the alpha one. You should see something like that. We're going to blur that thing. We're going to give it a Gaussian blur of six pixels. And let's talk about why. So let's pop into the channels there, click on that alpha channel, make it visible. And we're going to go under Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. OK, that's a rather large <laughs> radius. Six pixels, or thereabouts, six-ish. There we go. All right, now we've got this blurry alpha channel here. Fortunately, we still have a sharp version of this. Yes, we blurred it in the alpha channel. But if we look in the RGB, this layer here, and if you turn the background off, you can see what's going on. We've got this floating black type over top of a white background. All right. Well, let's pop back into our layers panel. So go back to the RGB there. We've got a little blurry alpha channel there. And don't click on the eyeball. If you click on the eyeball, you'll see this kind of red ruby lift layer over top of it. Uh, this is just so you can see what the layer mask looks like at the same time as your RGB channels. So instead of clicking on the eyeball, click on the letters R, G, and B. Let's get back into that RGB mode. Let's pop back into the layers here. And we're going to make a 50% gray layer, but we're going to float it over top of this title layer here. So let's make a new transparent layer. And we're going to fill it. And under contents, 50% gray. So new transparent layer. And you can do it from the little icon right between the trash can and the folder there. It gives you a transparent layer. And then we're going to go under edit and fill. And we'll choose 50% gray. And we'll hit OK. And the reason we made a new transparent layer, if I'd had this layer highlighted and filled with 50% gray, it would have gone right over top of my type in here. And we still need that type. We got the alpha channel from it, but we're going to need that type as well. So by making a new transparent layer, it gave us this 50% gray just floating over top of that type there. Now, let's take a look at actually rendering that lighting style. Remember I said if the piece of paper had a little bit of a raised bit to it, the light on this side would make it lighter, the light on that side would make it darker. We can simulate that with, if you go under Filter and Render, Lighting Effects. And your screen might come up differently than mine on the Properties panel here. If you click on the pop-up, you'll see there's Point Light, Spotlight, Infinite Light. Uh, an infinite light is kind of like imagine the sun shining down onto a piece of paper. It's all coming from the same direction. A point light source is just a light that just kind of shines over top of the paper. A spotlight is something that you can angle and kind of have it rake across the surface. Now right now, well, it doesn't look very interesting, does it? But if you scroll down, you'll see a pop-up called Texture. And right now, it's set to None. If you click on the pop-up there, you'll see the name of your alpha channel. Remember, you can call it anything you want. I call mine anything we want. And if I select it, look at that. There's a height slider that's now active. And if you grab that slider and move it left and right, you can have it raised slightly up or kind of dipping down into the surface. I'm going to go raised slightly up. And I can pull the sides to make it a wider light. I can grab this middle part and move it around. So guys, take a look at what's happening here. Remember this type was really hard edged. It was like pure black and white. Look at how this has a little bit of roundness to it. When we did the Gaussian blur on the alpha channel, now it's got a little bit of a, a hill to it. And that's what we're seeing on the edges here. 
Now, it's not looking like a, a really metallic looking thing just yet, but we're going to play around with the contrast and, and make it look really metallic-y. It's not hugely critical what it looks like here. Just click the OK button. If you lose sight of the corner points, like maybe you've pulled it so far that it's outside your screen, if you zoom out a little bit, a little bit of Command minus, you can get back to these little points here, which will let you kind of resize, stretch things around. And I think that looks pretty good for mine. I'm going to hit OK. Now, it's not looking really metallic, is it? Let's look at what's going on here. We've talked about clipping masks before. Do you guys remember clipping masks or clipping groups? If you clip something to a layer below, it can only affect that layer. Like, let's say, for example, I'm just going to call up an example image here. You guys don't have this image, but let me just give you an idea of what these clipping groups are all about. Let's say I had a whole bunch of layers here and I put a, you know, a layer over top. I want to do like a little portfolio thing that I can mail out to people, a little mailer piece here. If you look in the layers panel here, layer one, this is that little image that I dropped over top of it. And maybe I think it's a little bit too bright. If I throw on an adjustment layer, let's say I put on a curves and I use this to darken it down. Uh-oh, notice how it's also darkening the background. But if I clip this curves layer to the layer one, and there's a bunch of ways you can do it. If you right click on the name curves, you can get to create clipping mask. And look what happens. This layer jumps to the right a few pixels. And look, it's only affecting that picture. So when you clip something to a layer, it only affects the layer that it's clipped to. And if you want to take it a step further, if I move this aside, look, there's a gray rectangle down here, and that's this layer here, rounded rectangle. It's just a little gray rectangle sitting there. And if I put this image right over top of it, and I clip layer one, I clip this image down onto the rounded rectangle, look at what happens. Boink! Oh! It's now only visible where that rounded rectangle exists. If I release the clip, well, I can see this wherever it is. When I clip it, though, to that rectangle, it's only visible inside that area. And we can do something similar to our layer one here. This is where we have that kind of raised effect. Look what happens if I clip it, boink, onto that type layer down below. The type layer, this is the first layer that we created. And look, it's black with a transparent background. If I clip this gray layer to it, oh, you get this kind of cool raised lettering effect. But it's not very metallic looking. And if you look in the, um, the PDF, that's really metallic. How can we make ours look that metallic? Well, let's play around with it a little bit. There's a bunch of things we could do to this. One of them is play around with the curves. If I went under Image, Adjustments, Curves, and you can see I've got my layer one highlighted here. If I go down to Curves, let's talk a little bit about how this curves here works. Right now, I've got some light gray in here. I've got some dark gray. I've got some really dark gray. I don't think I have anything pure black in here. Well, it's maybe getting close to black around here. But all of the shades of gray on my lettering here is represented somewhere on this gray ramp down here. Like here's white, and there's white down there. Here's black, and maybe there's some black right in there. And there's some mid gray, maybe around there. And this 45 degree line represents no change. Like if I grabbed the middle of this curve and I pulled it down, everything would darken. And that makes sense if you think about what curves does. 45 degrees means no change. So if I have an input of 128, remember 128 is 50% gray, an input of 128, instead of having an output of 128, like that 45 degree line does, this new curve gives me an output of maybe around 64 or so. so it's become darker. Remember, this is 255, which is white, and this is zero, which is black. So my 128 has become darker. Everything has become darker. Everything is below the line. So if I went to my three-quarter tone, it's no longer a three-quarter tone. It's more like a, a half tone. It's around like 50% there. But because it's a curve, we can put multiple points on that. This is just one point that I pulled down. If I pulled it up, everything would get lighter. But what if I push this dot over to the left, this little point that I had. If I put it over to the left and I pushed it up really high, most of this image has become 255. So anything from 128, here's 0, here's 255, here's 128. Everything from 128 up has become white. OK, the whole thing is blown out and, well, frankly, a little bit nasty looking. But what if I grabbed a second point and I started to pull this down? 
the brighter parts of the image are now getting darker. And we can move these points around. I can add more points. I can add another point to kind of pull this down, maybe pull this back up, bring this over. And I can put as many points on here as I want. Now we're starting to get kind of a, a funky sort of look. And when you see something that looks like what you're looking for, you just hit OK. Everyone's is going to look a little bit different. That's fine. So now it kind of looks like a metallic plaque with Maybe a, a hall light above it kind of shining down on another wall. Whatever. It's, it's got a metallic look. That's what we're looking for. Let's take a look at what we've got going here. If I unclip it, let me release this clipping mask. And this is what I've done. When I did the curves, remember before on this layer, I've got, you know, light gray all the way up to dark gray. Once I did those curves on it, though, I said, you know, anything that was really bright will become really dark. So suddenly this will be dark. Anything that was really dark will become bright. So when I did my curves, image, adjustments, curves, as I pull this side up and this side down, and maybe this side back up and maybe this side down, you can see these bands of tonality starting to appear. If you do this to a color image, you actually can get some pretty cool effects happening as well. And you can see where it used to be bright and then making its way out to dark. Well, what used to be bright has become kind of grayish. Look at that. What used to be bright has become kind of grayish. And then what used to be really dark has gotten, for some reason, quite a bit lighter because I pulled this up, and then dark again. So where it used to be light making its way out to dark, light making its way out to dark. Now it's dark, light, dark, light, dark. So we've got dark, light, dark, light, dark. This is what we did with the curves in there. Now, if I move that around, let me just hit OK on that. And right now, it lines up with that layer down below it. So if I were to clip it, right click, create clipping mask, boink, there we go. It lines up with that layer down below. Excellent. If I move it though, if I grab my move tool and I move this around, it doesn't line up with what's down there anymore. So we can't necessarily move that background relative to the foreground anymore. It's kind of locked down. All right. I also want mine to look like it's um, like a sign, like a, maybe a, a brass sign or something that you could uh, nail onto a door. We'll take a look at the layer stack here. Here's that white background. There's the metallic look. There's the type. If I wanted to put like a little sign behind it, so it looked like it was on a plaque, where in the layer stack should it go? At the top, in the middle, below? I'd put it right below these two things here. These are what make up this lettering here. If I want to put a little sign behind it, I'm going to put it on a, a blue plaque just for the heck of it. Now, when you make a new transparent layer, like if I click this icon here, it's going to appear directly above whichever of these layers is currently highlighted. And right now, this top one is my currently highlighted layer. So if I click this icon, it would appear at the top. I'd have to grab it and drag it down into this section down here. If I wanted it to appear directly there, what would I do? If I click on my background layer, that'll be my highlighted layer. And when I click on it, it would appear directly above it. So either way, I could do it like this. I've got the top layer highlighted because that's what I did the curves on. I could click the new layer icon and drag it, physically drag it down. If you grab it with this, notice how you kind of get this grabby hand icon. And as I go downward, see that blue line that appears? That shows me where it's going to appear. When I get it so the blue line appears right above background and I let go, boink, it drags it from the top of the stack down to the bottom, right below the Greg Danberg. The other thing I could do, I could click on the background layer. See how it's highlighted? It's kind of a lighter gray. And if I click my new layer icon now, well, let me just throw out that one there. There we go. So I highlight my background. And if I click it now, boink, it appears directly above the background. Now, if I want to give this thing some kind of a plaque sort of look, I'm going to grab my marquee tool, make a little, there we go, little marquee around it. And I'm going to choose Edit. Fill, and I said I wanted to do a blue plaque. So for contents, I'm going to choose color and kind of a cyan -y blue. Hit OK. That chooses the color. Hit OK. Make sure this opacity is 100%. And there's my blue plaque. I can deselect, get rid of those marching ants. If this lettering really was kind of raised above the level of this plaque here, 
it looks like the light is kind of coming this direction. It would probably have a little bit of a shadow on it, wouldn't it? At the very bottom of the layers panel, you'll see something that says FX on it, like special effects. Those are layer styles. They're not called layer effects, but for some reason, Adobe has put a little FX icon here. Uh, and that lets us put different layer styles onto it. So if I selected my name layer here, uh, if I would put a little, a little bit of a shadow, like if the light was shining on, it would probably have a bit of a shadow. So if I select this layer here, I can click on this little FX, and I could choose, it's called a drop shadow, because it kind of looks like a shadow that just sort of drops down onto it. I can play around with the opacity of it. I can play around with the size to choose how soft that shadow is. I can click inside here and drag it around to get the angle and the distance. It doesn't have to be horribly noticeable. Yeah, something subtle like that can help. What we're doing here, we're starting from nothing and we're creating things that we can use to uh, create larger compositions. Um, there's an artist named Bert Monroy and he starts with a photograph, but then just from within Photoshop, he'll generate textures, he'll generate um, shapes, uh, he'll give roundness to things. Like, you know, we kind of put a little bit of a bevel onto here, a little bit of roundness, we put a little bit of a shadow on here. Um, and what we've created here, well, we want to keep things editable just in case we change our minds about stuff. So it's never a bad idea to save as you go. Have you ever heard that term before? Say G, S-A-Y-G, save as you go. Um, let's save this up as a, as a file um, because we may need these layers later on. So let's go under File, Save As. And, and what file format would be a good one for this? Because we've got a lot of layers in here. PSD, Photoshop document. File, save as, throw that on the desktop, and I'll call this door plaque. And for the format, I'll go to the Photoshop document, or PSD. It's always the very top one in the list there. And I'll hit save. And once it's saved, you can safely close it down. 